The culture around us seems to be increasingly materialistic, lustful, and greedy. But we are not far removed from the nature of the audience of many of the Apostle Paul's epistles. In every age, the church has been a beacon of light in a dark world. In today's message on the Bible Study Hour, Dr. James Boyce discusses the purpose and uniqueness of the church as we begin a series on the book of Ephesians. <music> Welcome to the Bible Study Hour with Dr. James Boyce, preparing you to think and act biblically. The book of Ephesians has been described as the Grand Canyon of Scripture. Vast and deep, yet simple and compelling, the points of doctrine outlined in the book give Ephesians the feel of a mini-course in theology. Let's listen in together as Dr. Boyce walks through a helpful introduction to the book. I find as I study various books of the Bible that the commentators who write on them inevitably extol their book as the most important, the deepest, the most relevant book in all of Scripture. Ephesians is no exception to that. William Barclay, in his commentary on the book, calls Ephesians the queen of the epistles. Armitage Robinson, in a commentary written about the turn of the century, called it the crown of St. Paul's writings. Going even further back in history, the English poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who is quoted by Barclay, termed this book the divinest composition of man, because, as he believed, it embraces first those doctrines peculiar to Christianity and then those precepts common with it in natural religion. John McKay, a former president of Princeton Theological Seminary who was converted in his youth through reading and studying this book, calls Ephesians the greatest, maturest, and for our time the most relevant of all Paul's writings. This letter is pure music, he said. Ruth Paxson called Ephesians the Grand Canyon of Scripture meaning that it's breathtakingly beautiful and apparently inexhaustible to the one who wants to take it in. Well, these superlatives will have to stand or fall on their own merit, of course. But the point I would like to make as we begin a study of this book today is that if the book of Ephesians is profound and deep and relevant and meaningful, it is not because... It expounds mysterious doctrines that are nearly unfathomable and would be utterly unknown to us if it weren't for this book, but because it presents in the simplest and most compelling language those doctrines which are basic to all Christianity. Brookfoss Westcott, in an unfinished but nevertheless very valuable commentary, has an appendix in which, as a wrap-up of his study of the book, he considers the distinct doctrines that Ephesians presents. There are 27 of them. He deals with God the Father, Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the will of God, the world, creation, the unseen world, angels, evil powers, the devil, the church, the communion of saints, the sacraments, the Christian ministry, and many other doctrines, 27 of them, and yet the point I wish to make is that there is not one of these doctrines that is not found elsewhere in other portions of the Word of God, sometimes at much greater length. So the doctrines we're going to find in this book are not esoteric. The doctrines we're going to find in Ephesians are fundamental. They are, in its simplest form and in simple truth, just basic Christianity. Now that causes one to ask the question, well, then what is the special appeal of the book? And in my judgment, the appeal is just that, that it presents the basic doctrines of Christianity comprehensively, clearly, practically, and winsomely. Or I can put it another way. Uh, the central doctrine in this letter to the Ephesians is the doctrine of the church, is God's new society. And there is therefore a sense in which all these other doctrines, which I've mentioned and others which we will mention along the way, 
All these other doctrines have bearing upon the church. And as we study them, we find, therefore, their practical application to us who are trying to live as God's new society in this world. These doctrines tell us who we are, how we came to be as we are, what we shall be, and what we must do now in light of that destiny. John Stott writes, The whole letter is thus a magnificent combination of Christian doctrine and Christian duty, Christian faith and Christian life, of what God has done through Christ and what we must do in consequence. Now, the letter is written to the Ephesians, and this presents a problem, at least to some scholars, because the words in Ephesus that occur in verse 1 are not in three of the oldest manuscripts. The Vatican and Sinaitic uncials and the Chester Beatty papyrus, which predates the other two. It's not just a matter that those words in Ephesus are missing either. One of the notable characteristics of this book, which sets it off from most of Paul's other letters, is that it has no personal greetings. Romans has a whole last chapter of personal greetings, and Paul hadn't even been to Rome. Same is true of First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, other books as well. Ephesians doesn't have that. And yet, we know from the presentation of Paul's travels that we have in the book of Acts that Paul spent two years in this city, a long, long time for his itinerant ministry. He undoubtedly knew many, many people in the city of Ephesus. He wrote this book, as we believe, later when he was in prison. He says so in the first verse of chapter 3. Therefore, after the time he had spent in Ephesus, and if that's the case, we ask, well, if he knew all these people and he was writing to them, why doesn't he even mention one of them by name? Or, to make the matter even more complicated, in the second century, the heretic Marcion referred to the book of Ephesians, not by that name, but as Paul's letter to the Laodiceans. And so we begin to wonder what the real story of the transmission of that book really was. There have been two theories devised to explain it. One of them arises from the fact that the book of Ephesians is clearly very closely related to the book of Colossians. There are 55 verses in those two letters which are virtually identical. And from the fact that in the fourth chapter of Colossians, verse 16, Paul commends to the Colossian Christians a letter which he had also, as he said, written to the Laodiceans. And he said, I'd like you to read their letter, and I would like them to read yours. In other words, exchange them. There are people who have said, well, on the basis of that, it would seem that Paul wrote both letters at the same time, that he dispatched them by the same messenger, which apparently is true, and that one was known, at least at that point, as the letter to the Colossians, and the other as the letter to the Laodiceans, and that that second letter is our book of Ephesians. Well, that may all be true enough, but it doesn't explain why a letter which originally was called the letter to the Laodiceans came to be called the letter to the Ephesians, and it doesn't explain why, if that was the case, we have no manuscripts that have the word Laodicea in verse 1 instead of the word Ephesus. The second theory is this, that Paul originally wrote this book as what we would call a cyclical letter or circular letter. That is, that there was a blank space there, and multiple copies were made. One would be sent to Ephesus, and they would fill that in, in Ephesus. And one would be sent to Laodicea, and they would fill that in, in Laodicea, and so on for all the seven churches of Asia Minor, those that are mentioned in the second and third chapter of the book of Revelation. That is probably the best explanation of all. And the reason it would come to be known as the letter to the Ephesians is that Ephesus was the capital city, the most important city in that particular region. And it would be from there that other copies of the letters would be made and sent throughout the Roman world. Well, whatever the proper answer to this technical problem may be, there is no doubt whatsoever that one copy of this letter was at least sent to the Ephesians. And it is from the very earliest days of church history that this letter was 
so regarded. Brooke Foss Westcott, in his study, the one I mentioned earlier, points out that in the writings of the fathers, the patristic writings, this book is identified as the letter to the Ephesians from the very earliest days. Now, what was this city of Ephesus? It was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. It was on the river Kaistar, not far from the Aegean coast. The river was navigable up to Ephesus, and therefore it was a protected and very valuable port. It became a center for commerce, a mercantile center, and also for communication. It was the major link between Rome in the west and all of the country to the east. Produce passed through there. Nations and races mingled in the streets, Jew and Gentile, bond and free, Greek and Roman. All of them were there in this city of Ephesus. Ephesus was materialistic. Ephesus was also a spiritual center. The thing that the Ephesians were most proud of about their city was the great temple of Diana or Artemis that was on the outskirts of the city and which was identified even in that time as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was uh, an enormous structure for one thing. The records uh, indicate that it was 425 feet long, 220 feet wide, and 60 feet high. And to give you a comparison so you can understand how big that temple was, it was four times the size of the Greek Parthenon in Athens. So it was an enormous structure. It had huge columns, and in addition to everything else, it had a treasury in which huge amounts of capital had been deposited so that it became, in effect, the bank of Asia. It was built because the Ephesians believed that a special statue of Diana or Artemis had come down from heaven, and it was this statue that was worshipped there at Ephesus. The temple was served by hundreds, if not thousands, of priestesses who were, in effect, temple prostitutes. This was the city to which Paul came on his third missionary journey, visiting it briefly first on his second journey and then staying for a period of more than two years on his third journey. It was in this city that God was pleased to establish a faithful Christian church And it was to the Christians in this city that this book of Ephesians was written, this book that we're to study now carefully. Paul begins by identifying himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. It's a very interesting way he has of introducing himself. If Ephesians was written from Rome, as we believe, toward the end of Paul's ministry and service, It would have been possible for him to introduce himself in a quite different way. Paul could have begun by reminding the Ephesians of all the many things he had done in the service of Jesus Christ, how he had been an ambassador throughout the Roman world and was now an ambassador in chains. He could even, I suppose, have talked about the things that he had suffered physically in order to bring the gospel of God's grace in Christ to these very people in the city of Ephesus. Yet Paul doesn't do that. Paul introduces himself, as he characteristically does in other epistles, by saying, first of all, that he is an apostle of Christ, and then secondly, that he is an apostle of Christ by the will of God. An apostle, of course, was one whom Jesus himself had chosen to be a recipient of the New Testament revelation and an official promulgator of that gospel. The Apostles, uh, largely, were those who were the disciples of Jesus Christ, who spent time with him during the days of his flesh. But there were others as well, and Paul was one. The Lord had called him and commissioned him when he was on the way to Damascus to persecute the Christians. The Lord Jesus had turned his life around, had given him a new direction entirely, and from that time on, Paul was God's man, God's apostle, to bear the message of salvation to the Gentile communities. Now, when Paul introduces himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus, we're to take that, therefore, with full seriousness. In other words, this book that we're about to study is not like other books that have been written by men and women, books that we can read and 
enjoy if we find them enjoyable or learn from if they're helpful and also reject if we decide that what we find there is not useful. This book is not like that. If Paul is writing this book as an apostle of Jesus Christ, whom he declares himself to be, and if, as he says in 1 Corinthians, the apostles speak not by words taught with human wisdom, but by words given by the Holy Spirit, interpreting spiritual things by spiritual words, then this is God's book that Paul is communicating to us. It is God's truth, God's revelation, and is therefore authoritative. This means right from the start, as we begin to study it, we must study it not as something over which we sit in judgment, but rather as the Word of God which sits in judgment upon us. I think, however, that although that is certainly an emphasis of the word apostle, in view of the fact that in verses 3 to 15, which come immediately after this, that in those verses Paul emphasizes the sovereignty of God in salvation, I think that the emphasis that Paul has in this opening phrase is not on the word apostle, but on the phrase, by the will of God. Because, you see, it was only by the will of God that Paul became an apostle. As a matter of fact, it was only by the will of God that Paul even became a Christian. Because left to himself, that is, as Paul was before God stopped him on the road to Damascus and redirected his life, left to himself, Paul, far from furthering the work of Christ, far from building up the church, was actually intent on destroying it. Paul was an enemy of God. And when Paul looked back over his life, as he did on many occasions, and has even done in some of the books that he has left for us, Paul was always conscious of the fact that it was the grace of God flowing solely from the will of God that had turned his life around. And so it is for us, so it was for these Christians at Ephesus, if we are followers of Jesus Christ today rather than being enemies of Jesus Christ today, it is because this was the will of God in the matter of our salvation. So we begin to study this book, and at the very opening of the book, we're humbled before God, and our eyes are lifted up to see Him as the source and center of all things. What this teaches us is that we must always start with God. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his commentary, puts it this way. He says, much of the trouble in the church today is due to the fact that we are so subjective, so interested in ourselves, so egocentric. Having forgotten God and having become so interested in ourselves, we become miserable and wretched and spend our time in shallows and in miseries. The message of the Bible from beginning to end is designed to bring us back to God, to humble us before God, and to enable us to see our true relationship to Him. And he adds, that is the great theme of this epistle. Now it's also the theme of the second part of verse 1, because having first of all described himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, Paul now turns to those to whom he is addressing the letter and he identifies them. He identifies them in three ways. He calls them saints, he says they are faithful, and he says that they are in Christ Jesus. If I may put it this way, those three terms constitute what is the absolute minimum of what it means to be a Christian. Now let's look at them. First of all, Christians are saints. I recognize as I say this that that runs counter to what most people have in mind when they use the word saint. This is due not merely to the misconceptions of Christian things that the world so often has, but also to the error of some forms of the professing church. In the Roman Catholic Church, for example, a saint is one who is a particularly good person and who has been elevated to the status of sainthood by ecclesiastical operations. It's done in a very formal way. A person is first of all nominated as a saint, then a trial is held in which there are literally two sides. There's an advocate on behalf of the one who is nominated, his job is to present the virtues of the candidate, to show how good that particular individual is, and to show that in at least one instance that individual had been responsible for a miracle. And then on the other hand, there's an advocate against the person, a devil's advocate, which is where we get the term, a devil's advocate. And the job of that particular person is to show that the one who was nominated is not a good person, 
that he or she does not deserve to be a saint. Because of the well-oiled machinery of the church, to my knowledge, no one who was ever nominated to be a saint was ever successfully accused by the devil's advocate and not allowed to stand. After the trial is held and the person is judged fit, the church elevates that one to sainthood. The world has a similar idea. Oh, it's not so elaborate, but the world says, well, there's a saint, if there ever was one. And what they mean is there's somebody who is too good to live among normal human beings. Now, that's not the biblical idea. I'm sure you recognize that although, as I'm going to show in a moment, the world's word saint does have moral overtones, in biblical terminology, a saint is essentially one who has been set apart to God, and that is done by God. That's to say, it's not by human goodness, as if we could commend ourselves to God, but it is by the very act of the will of God that Paul, in the earlier phrase, talks about himself being made an apostle. What happened when Paul was made an apostle? Well, God stepped down and set Paul apart from what he was doing to what God wanted him to do. And the same thing happens in salvation. God reaches down and sets us apart from ourselves and our own preoccupations to his holy service. Now, you see that dramatized at different points in the Bible. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, Moses is instructed at one point to sanctify the altar and the laver in the Jewish tabernacle. Now, when he sanctified them or made saints of them, he didn't somehow make the material that was used in the construction of the laver or the stones that were used in the construction of the altar more holy. You don't make inanimate objects holy. What it means is that Moses was to set those objects apart for sacred use. Before that, they had been just stones. Now, they were be an altar, and the altar was to be used in God's service. Or again, to give another example, in his great high priestly prayer, in the 17th chapter of John, the Lord Jesus Christ prays, For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified. Now, if Jesus were talking primarily about being made more holy, he would be praying that God would make him more holy, which, of course, is impossible because Jesus already was holy. That which is perfect cannot become more so. But when you recognize that the word saint or sanctify has to do with being set apart, you understand at once what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, for their sakes, I set myself apart to the work of the cross so that by my death they might be saved and might be set aside or set apart to God. Now, it's in that sense that these people at Ephesus who had believed on Christ were saints. God had set them apart to himself. Now, it follows from that that they must, by very definition, have some sort of radical break with the world. doesn't mean that they were taken out of the world. That isn't the way God operates. God leaves us in the world to do his work. But it does mean that in a very real sense they were not of the world. That is in the sense of having a break with it, of having new priorities, a new Lord, a new agenda, and above all, being part of a new society. And they were conscious of these things. We can say as we apply this that if you are not conscious of a radical break with the world so that now Jesus is your Lord rather than the spirit of this age, and if you're not conscious of having a new agenda and a new set of priorities and belonging to a new society, you are not a Christian. Because, look, Paul writes to all the saints in Ephesus, and what he's saying is that all who are Christians in Ephesus are saints, and all saints are Christians. There's just no other way. I said a moment ago that the word, though it refers primarily to being set apart to God, nevertheless does have ethical overtones, and I return to that now because it follows that if Jesus has set us apart from the world and if his life is within us so that he is leading us on, then we are going to begin to live as he lives in the world. This is to say that a saint will increasingly be saintly. In theological language, the way of talking about this is usually to say that there is no justification without regeneration. We are justified by grace through faith, apart from works. But nevertheless, the one who is so justified is also regenerated, which means that the life of Christ is within, and therefore there will be, along with everything else, certain ethical changes. Paul says the same thing in the second chapter that we're going to come to. He's talking about salvation. He says it's not of works so that no one can boast. It's all of grace. 
received through faith. But immediately after having said that in verses 8 and 9 of that chapter, in verse 10 he goes on to say, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So you see, a Christian is one who has been set apart by God, but who by the very fact that he's been set apart by God now lives for God in this wicked age. Second phrase is faithful. Now this has two senses as well. That word faithful means in the first instance to exercise faith. A Christian is one who exercises faith, that is, who believes the gospel. Now when we talk about faith in that sense, we're not talking about a superficial thing. We're talking about that which is life transforming. Generally when we define faith, we say that faith in the biblical sense, in the full saving biblical sense, has three elements. There's an intellectual element, because you can't have faith in just nothing. Faith has content. You must understand what it is you're called upon to believe. Therefore, it's essential that the gospel be proclaimed. Unless the word is proclaimed and people hear and understand it, there's no possibility of faith. But faith isn't merely intellectual understanding. The second element is emotional, or the heart element. That is to say that when we hear this gospel, which is not just something that is incidental, true, but perhaps something that doesn't make a difference, but rather that which is life transforming, that which has to do with the death of the very Son of God for me, a sinner, that must, if I truly understand it, affect me on a deep, deep level. And so faith involves that heart response to the gospel. And then the third element is the element of personal commitment. Because when I understand that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me, I recognize that the only adequate response to that is my faith in him, by which I receive him personally as my savior. We have a great example of that in the 20th chapter of John. It concerns the man we call Doubting Thomas. Thomas had not been present when Jesus first appeared to the disciples, and when he was told that Jesus was raised from the dead, he wouldn't believe it. He said, I won't believe it unless I can put my finger into the nail marks in his hands and thrust my hand into the wound in his side. But Jesus did come to Thomas. He sought him out. He revealed himself, thus satisfying him intellectually that Jesus had indeed died for his sin and was indeed raised from the dead and touching his heart so that Thomas began to respond on an emotional level, and as a result of that, Thomas made that great personal commitment with which the book of John properly ends. He fell at Christ's feet, worshiping, saying, My Lord and my God. It is proper to say that no one is a Christian who is not faithful in that sense. And to put it the other way around, all who exercise faith in that sense are true Christians. And yet there's this other element. Faithful doesn't only mean to exercise faith. It means to be full of faith or continue in faith or, as we might say colloquially, to keep the faith. It means to persevere to the end. That is why Jesus said, as it's recorded in Matthew, he who stands firm to the end shall be saved. Now, usually in Reformed circles, when we talk about this doctrine of perseverance. Reformed Christians mean that it is the doctrine of God's persevering with his people. That is, we stand firm because he stands firm with us. He doesn't abandon us. He keeps us through all situations of life. And that is absolutely true, well and good. But you see, it does follow from that, that if God perseveres with us so that the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints means God's perseverance, it is no less also true that we, simply because God perseveres, must persevere. So the Christian, you see, is not merely one who has exercised faith in Jesus Christ and committed himself to him, but also one who now goes on to live in that very faith, persevering to the end, because God is at work. God, the unchangeable one, is at work in that person's life. It is proper to say that no one who does not persevere is a Christian, and yet all who persevere are Christians, and all Christians persevere. The third phrase here is, in Christ Jesus. This is a difficult one 
It's so difficult that the Bible itself has to use images to help us understand it. It uses the image of a temple in which Christ is the cornerstone and we are individual stones. The image of a body in which he is the head and we are individual members. It uses the image of the vine and the branches where Christ is the vine and we are the branches. The image of marriage in which Jesus is the bridegroom and we are the bride. All those images. Very important idea. This phrase, in Christ, or in him, or its equivalents, occurs nine times in just this next section of Ephesians, verses 3 through 14, and altogether it occurs 164 times in Paul's writings. So much so that a little bit later here in Ephesians, Paul can even say, that our being in Christ means that we have been raised in Christ even though our own resurrection has not taken place yet and we have been made to sit with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus even though we're not in heaven yet. We're going to study that at greater length but let me say here that whether we understand it or not and probably we don't understand it fully union with Christ is nevertheless in one sense the very whole of salvation. John Murray, who is an able expositor of this theme, wrote, Union with Christ has its source in the election of God the Father before the foundation of the world, and it has its fruition in the glorification of the sons of God. The perspective of God's people is not narrow. It has the expanse of eternity. Its orbit has two foci. One, the electing love of God the Father in the counsels of eternity. The other, glorification with Christ in the manifestation of his glory. The former has no beginning, the latter has no end. Apart from Christ, that is not united to Christ, all is misery. We are lost. But in him, in Jesus, we have all things, and the end is glorious. Now, the very last phrase of this introduction to the epistle by Paul speaks of grace and peace. To you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tie it to what I have said already in this fashion. When I was talking about the second part of verse 1, I mentioned that that phrase in Ephesus is missing from several of the earliest manuscripts and that it may indicate that in its original form this letter was a circular, that is addressed to Christians throughout the entire Asian province. That may be true. As a matter of fact, it probably is true. But whether that is true or not, there is no doubt that this letter nevertheless went to specific churches and one copy of the letter at least went to Ephesus. So that when Paul wrote to these Christians, he was not writing to Christians who were in no place at all, but he was writing to Christians who were here in this world, in this case, in Ephesus, in the very place which they were required to bear a witness for Jesus Christ. And Ephesus as we have seen, was a materialistic, secular, pagan, sex-orientated culture, just like our own. You say, was Ephesus materialistic? Our cities are materialistic. Was Ephesus pagan? Our cities are pagan. All the things that could be said about that great pagan city are true of our own. We ask the question, therefore, if Paul was writing to Christians in a place like that, telling them how they were to live and why they were to live that way. He is also writing to us to tell us how we should live and why we should live that way. And we ask the question, how in the midst of that kind of an environment are we to do it? And the answer right here at the very beginning of the book is that it is by the grace of God. You and I look at our culture and polish up our armor, put on our white hat, and dash out and say, well, we're going to change the world. We'll find soon enough that we're not going to change it. The world's going to change us. And we're going to become just like it, entangled in its sin. But if we rely upon the grace of God, if we grow in the knowledge of Christ Jesus, who is the center of the gospel, then by the will of God, that power will be in us. And we'll be able to live in a way that is victorious and brings glory to his most holy name. Let us pray. Our Father, 
We ask you to bless these studies of the book of Ephesians, which we are about to undertake. We ask you to bless them above all because the book is one in which the most basic teachings of the gospel are presented for Christians living in a secular environment. And that's what we need, Father. We don't need esoteric truth. We need basic truth because that's the kind of world in which we live. And so, Father, help us to grow in the knowledge of what is ours in Christ, to grow in our devotion to him, and to grow in strength so that we might honor him by the way we conduct ourselves in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're listening to the Bible Study Hour with the Bible teaching of Dr. James Boyce, a listener-supported ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. The Alliance exists to promote a biblical understanding and worldview, drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformed theologians from decades and even centuries gone by. We seek to provide Christian teaching that will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Alliance Broadcasting includes the Bible Study Hour with Dr. James Boyce, Every Last Word with Bible Teacher Dr. Philip Ryken, and Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, featuring Donald Barnhouse. For more information on the Alliance, including a free introductory package for first-time callers, or to make a contribution, please call toll-free 1-800-488-1888. Again, that's 1-800-488-1888. 1888. You can also write the Alliance at Box 2000, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. Or you can visit us online at AllianceNet.org. For Canadian gifts, mail those to 237 Rouge Hills Drive, Scarborough, Ontario, M1C 2Y9. Ask for your free resource catalog featuring books, audio, commentaries, booklets, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians. Thank you again for your continued support and for listening to the Bible Study Hour.